Hello, I'm Professor Steve Miller. Welcome back to Compressible Flow. Today we'll be talking about one-dimensional flows, wave propagation, the idea of the speed of sound, and the all-important concept of Mach waves. So some of these are very new concepts for some of you, and others it might be a little bit of a review. Let's get started. I like to start with a quote sometimes because that might be inspirational. This one's written by Ernst Mach in his writing. He writes, I know nothing more terrible than the poor creatures who have learned too much. Instead of the sound, powerful judgment which would probably have grown up if they had learned nothing, their thoughts creep timidly and hypnotically after words, principles, and formula, constantly by the same paths. What they have acquired is a spider's web of thoughts too weak to furnish sir supports but complicated enough to provide confusion. Perhaps he's thinking about some academics who are too lost in their vocabulary and words and are confused by their own equations. Nonetheless, let's look at some examples of quasi one-dimensional and one-dimensional flow. Here we see a visualization around a particular soccer ball mounted in a wind tunnel. This could be your spherical problem of flow. And we see some streamlines which might be considered one-dimensional flow. Here the flow moves from left to right and the ball is stationary. Streamlines are illuminated by this greenish looking dye and there's an orangish dye behind the ball. The dye here is smoke and these particular streamlines wrap around the ball and they separate, the boundary layer separates at some point and it wraps around and becomes a turbulent wake. But along these particular streamlines, we might treat the flow with one-dimensional or quasi-one-dimensional flow theory. We won't be able to use these particular tools to assess the, the turbulence behind the ball, especially because the turbulence is never isentropic. You can also see one particular streamline comes along and it stagnates on the ball's leading edge. This is interesting, and we'll try and analyze these types of flows everywhere except in the turbulent wake within this class. This has more industrial and interesting applications perhaps than the soccer ball or sphere in a wind tunnel, and that might be the whole ga natural gas industry. Here we have in figure 49 some particular pipes for natural gas. Uh, much of the heating, especially in the north and many countries, is done by natural gas, and its flow and process and delivery is of utmost importance. A small increase in the, tr the transportation of natural gas can help save our environment and, of course, reduce costs for homeowners paying for heating. In these cases, we might treat by reducing the equations of motion, the navier Stokes equations through the Reynolds transport theory, into something that can be analyzed and an important tool for this class. We'll look at some examples. Let's try and apply Reynolds transport theory to this so called one dimensional or semi one dimensional flow through the concept of the theory of the stream tube, which is a variation with, say, area with distance. Here in my own handwriting, and this is probably one reason I typeset so many things, you can see a particular stream tube and a stream tube of cross-sectional area variation. On the left, we have, say, an inlet and outlet, which are denoted by the circles. X is the streamwise direction, the direction of flow, and Y and Z are the cross-stream directions, respectively. We'll introduce some variables. A will be a constant. P is pressure. Rho is density. T is temperature and U is velocity. The cross-sectional area here is constant, C-O-N-S-T, constant. And the other quantities, pressure, density, rho, temperature, T, velocity, U, just the U component of the velocity because it's one-dimensional, only vary with X. You can imagine we can apply that same type of process to the particular stream tubes in a pipe or these stream lines or stream tubes going over the soccer ball except it's very probable that the cross-sectional area of the soccer ball problem, if we look at like this top streamline or even one along here that bends around the ball, probably has an area change. In fact, many new and early aerodynamicists in the 40s, 50s, and 60s were encouraged to think about aerodynamic flow in terms of stream tubes and their deformation. This led to the idea, of course, of, of relaxing the area constant relationship here on the right. Here I've drawn the same stream tube, but area varies. So in this case, area is now a function of x, density rho, 
pressure, P, temperature, T, and velocity, U, are also functions of X and A. Since A is a function of X, we might write simply that U, T, P, and rho are just functions of area. This is going to be a critical concept in the coming parts of this class when we talk about isentropic flow. Nonetheless, in these particular cases, we might take a slice in the x, excuse me, the yz plane and write it down here and put a little differential control volume. So this might be the stream tube, and then we put a little slice through it with some small thickness of dx. x, this is the x direction still, and we'll go from state 1 to 2. State 1 is u1, p1, t1, rho1, e1, e is energy. State 2 is u2, p2, t2, rho2, and of course E2. We look to apply Reynolds transport theory across this differential volume with perhaps changing area. Let's try that soon. Now we'll assume that the flow is steady or statistically stationary. Steady flow means that of course there's temp it is temporally invariant, meaning it's not changing with time. Statistically stationary means that the flow could of course be changing with time, it's unsteady, however it has the restriction that if we take average properties, like time averages of say velocity or pressure fluctuations, they become a mean value which does not change in time. This is a simplistic definition of course of statistically stationary. Let's apply the continuity equation of Reynolds transport theory to this small little differential volume first. We'll know that there's a mass balance, so we don't have a mass sink or source, but we could always add that in later if we wanted. And we'll say that it's a surface integral of rho u dot ds. This will simplify to negative rho 1 u1 times a plus rho 2 u2 times a. We did not write a subscript 1 or 2 on a because that cross-sectional area did not change in this case. If it did, like in the upper right photo, we would just leave an a1 and a2. This is the mass balance, so we can simply write it as rho 1 u1 equals rho 2 u2. This is as done in your previous classes, I'm sure, and it seems rather trivial. We also need to apply the momentum equation, so let's do that now. Let's take our Reynolds transport theory, which we reviewed, and apply it to this one-dimensional and perhaps semi-one-dimensional problem if area is changing. We have no momentum sources or sinks, and so we can write the momentum flux minus the pressures on the surfaces will be zero. This is the momentum flux term, and this is the pressure term integrated on the volume. So you see here, this is the pressure. It could be the pressure changing as the flow moves, which is very probable because these flows are probably driven by a pressure gradient. So pressure should be changing. We want to account for that in the second term. Let's simplify this in the x direction and leave an area just without subscripts. We could add them in easily with 1 and 2 respectively. And we'll get in equation 140, rho 1 times the negative u1a times u1 plus rho 2 of u2a times u2 equals negative of the quantity negative p1a plus p2a. That's equation 140. We can simplify this to be in a similar form as the continuity equation in 138 as p1 plus rho 1 u1 squared equals p2 plus rho 2 u2 squared. What do we have here? This is the static pressure at the left face of our differential control volume plus some kind of momentum flux term plus the static pressure, internal pressure, that's the internal stress of the fluid at the exit plus, of course, rho 2 u2 squared. We've only applied this in the x direction. Now we're not accounting for, of course, pressure variation on the wall, and that's okay because we're, it's a one-dimensional theory. Now, this is a statistical stationary formulation for the x-momentum equation. What are we missing? Of course, we need to think about energy. We'll apply a Reynolds transport theorem for energy on the same differential volume. We'll write out it in its full form in 142. We'll have the heat transfer minus the surface integral of the pressure working with velocity is all equal to, of course, the energy flux. And we've already gotten rid of the volumetric integral because there's no energy source or sink in a particular flow, but we could always add that in later. 
Let's evaluate these surface integrals for the particular Reynolds transport problem. You'll find that we have, we'll carry down Q dot, which is a heat transfer term, and we'll leave that for now, minus the surface integral, and we'll have negative P1U1A plus P2U2A equals a right-hand side and a negative rho 1 times E1 plus U1 squared over 2 times U1A plus rho 2 E2 plus U2 squared over 2 U2A. So try and evaluate these surface integrals. Here you can see that we're assuming we have one-dimensional flow. Therefore, there's no variation, say, U as a function of Y or Z, so it's rather easy. One-dimensional flow along a particular point on a streamline or stream 2 of a fluid element. This is a straightforward integration, so we'll, I'll let you try it for yourself. And if you have questions, please come talk to me. And we'll try and simplify it by dividing through by the continuity equation, which we previously derived for constant area. We'll have rho 1 u1 equals rho, u, rho 2 u2. That's the density at the inlet times the velocity at the inlet is balanced by the density at the exit times the velocity at the exit, as shown in this equation right here, 138. And we'll have, after dividing 140 through by the continuity equation, q dot over rho 1 u1 a plus p1 over rho 1 plus e1, so energy, plus u1 squared equals p2 over rho 2 plus keeps heat transfer and has explicit terms for kinetic energy, pressure, and an internal energy. Let's try and write this in terms of enthalpy to simplify it. Here we'll say H is really the summation of internal energy E, which we use in our Reynolds transport theory, plus PV. So H equals E plus PV. Using this, and note V is volume and 1 over density, right, should give us a volume over a mass we'll have a modified energy equation in 145, which is H1, that's the enthalpy at state 1, or entering the differential volume, plus U1 squared over 2 plus Q equals H2 plus U2 squared over 2. This is the energy equation for steady one-dimensional flow with no cross-sectional area change and potential heat transfer addition. So now what do we have? We have three algebraic equations which have been reduced from integral form of the Reynolds transport theory. Of course, you'll have to remember the assumptions we made when we formed Reynolds transport theory. Here we don't have any particular viscous losses, which could be a major problem for the theory itself in its application. But if we assume that the flow is isentropic, we'll be able to solve many different particular problems, which corresponds loosely to the Reynolds transport theory assumption. Let's review the exact assumptions which I expect people to know when they apply these theories. If you apply these theories to a problem where you violate one assumption, of course you'll have the wrong answer. Therefore, it's very important to remember the assumptions for every theory or that you use in practice. So we assume that there's one dimensional flow, that the flow is steady, meaning it's time invariant. There's no viscous terms that viscosity is zero or it's unimportant in the particular flow we're looking at that the stream tube area is constant, that there's no particular body forces being applied like gravity or magnetic or hydrodynamics, and there's no particular shaft work being in, in the system. There's no work in the system in this particular part of the flow. You might ask yourself, have we made any other assumptions? And how did we arrive at these particular set of equations from our initial complicated partial differential equations, which are the Navier-Stokes equations? These are things I'd like you to think about and try and find your own path from the Navier-Stokes equations to the Reynolds transport theory to the simple one-dimensional analysis. And as you make that progress, you can write down each of these assumptions, major assumptions, to find this set of simple algebraic equations. Let's put those equations aside temporarily and look at the so-called speed of sound. This is a study in acoustics by Sir Isaac Newton in one of his famous publications. And this is reprinted, of course. Let's look at the caption first. It's a sketch of Newton's principle. In 1686, of the passage of waves through a tiny hole. The source is at a point A, and the hole is described as point B and C, particularly. 
you'll see that some particular source is placed on the left and waves, which are covered as black, come through and they impinge on the wall and they probably reflect and the reflection is not shown, but some of the waves go through this tiny little hole. And in fact, these waves scatter. And this is interesting, it was an early study, and you can do this with light or acoustics. And they have very similar properties because they're both waves governed by wave science. And we would need to understand this theory in the context of compressible flow. This is a very counterintuitive result. Let's look at particular speeds of sound and think about it with our particular analysis. For example, say we used Reynolds transport theory or another integral theory, or even the Navier-Stokes equations, to assess a one-dimensional type flow. Let's consider a gas, a plasma, or a liquid, or even the air in this room. A disturbance in the air, or a solid object acting on the air, can induce these types of waves. For example, we might have a little vibrating or pulsating sphere at location A. Today we might put a speaker, and it might play a tone at a single frequency, which generates disturbances. These disturbances in air are compression waves, meaning that the density is increasing and decreasing. So to understand compressible flow, it's very important to understand parts of the theory of acoustics. The disturbances in the air or solid objects acting on the air, that's forcing the air, might create disturbances that are compression waves which propagate at some speed. And the speed which they pro propagate, if they're acoustic waves, of infinitesimal amplitude is the speed of sound. This is the same speed of sound that we use with the Mach number. So the Mach number and speed of sound is intimately connected. There's different kinds of waves though. Acoustic waves are only one type of wave that travels in a fluid. You might also view that there's types of pressure waves or evanescent waves, and certainly there are shock waves and Mach waves, which we'll be discussing, which actually can travel faster than the speed of sound. So let's consider a small differential change between states one and two in our one-dimensional analysis, which we just performed, before and after acoustic wave disturbance. We'll call it state one is the state of the fluid in front of the wave. So you can imagine that a wave moves from left to right, and the disturbance in front of the wave will be on the right before the wave goes by it. And the state 2, the disturbance after the wave, will be at the same location after the wave passes by. So the undisturbed medium, the quiescent medium, we'll call C, the speed of sound, P, pressure, rho, density, and T, temperature. The acoustic wave is a tiny, tiny so-called infinitesimal disturbance of compression and all other thermodynamic variables in the fluid. As the acoustic wave passes, it should raise by the tiniest amounts the speed of sound, the pressure, the density, and temperature by differential elements dc, dp, d rho, and dt behind the wave. We can, of course, consider two reference frames to try and solve this problem. The first might be like a surfer in that they stand on the right wave and ride it. They're a wave rider, if you will, if you want to talk about aerospace terminology. And you might also think of a wave as passing by. In the formulation I just showed, these variables are disturbed in, of course, the standing reference frame. It might be like you're at the beach and you're standing in the water and watching waves pass by. So you're either the surfer or you're the beachgoer standing and watching. This is very much the same as like the Lagrangian or Larian point of view, respectively, in fluid dynamics. Let's try and apply our conservation of mass, momentum, and energy in the Eulerian, or that is wave standing observer framework. So we'll look at the conservation of mass. Recall it was rho one u one equals rho two u two, which we just derived. We'll now replace u with c. So they have the same units, and the velocity here is c. So we'll change the left-hand side, u1 with c, and we'll replace the right-hand side with, say, c plus dc, where my cursor is, and rho recalls, according to our formulation at state two, rho plus d rho. Now let's expand the result of rho c on the left-hand side and linearize. 
we'll find rho c goes as rho c plus c d rho plus rho d c plus d rho d c. Now I have a nonlinear term. Remember, d rho and d c are infinitesimal values. Two infinitesimal values are much, 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 much smaller than a single infinitesimal value. And this is the linearization that we say these infinitesimal values are so small that they're negligible in our analysis. If we do that, and of course use our equations after this substitution and analysis, you can try it for yourself, I encourage you, is to find equation 146 and solve for c. We'll find c, the speed of sound, goes as the negative of the density times the differential dc divided by d rho, so dc d rho, the small change in the speed of sound divided by the small change in density. So speed of sound is related to, of course, differentials of density and density itself. Before we continue, we should also look at the momentum equation, which is shown in equation 147. In equation 147, we have the pressure plus rho times c squared. Here, once again, I've taken my one-dimensional momentum equation and I'm substituting in u for c and all their variables plus their differential element on the right-hand side. So this is state one. We still have pressure plus rho times c squared. Recall our momentum equation on the previous slide of this class. And you'll have p plus dp on the right-hand side plus rho plus d rho, this term, times c plus dc squared. We can, once again, expand the terms and linearize the equations. And you'll note here, we'll have terms that are third, like d rho, dc, dc. That's three infinitesimals, which we would cross out, extremely small. We'll solve for the differential of c, the speed of sound. We'll have dc equals dp plus c squared d rho, all over negative two dc rho. Let's see what we can do with this wonderful equation. Well, we can combine our differential equations for 148 and 146 and find equation 149 after a little bit of algebraic simplification. We'll have c equals negative rho on dp over d rho plus c squared all over negative 2c rho. Let's now solve for c squared, which is shown here. And if you do that, and if you're keen, you'll find c squared equals dp over d rho. You'll note this is a very interesting equation. Why? Because it says the square of the speed of, speed of sound goes as the small differential change of pressure divided by the small differential change of density. It's a derivative of pressure with respect to density. Fascinating. You'll note that these disturbances of sound, remember, are very, very small. And we note that they're irreversible, dissipative, viscous, and thermal conduction is extremely small. And there's no heat addition. These correspond, these assumptions from experimental observation and confirmed with theory and experiment and computation, that the process is therefore isentropic for acoustic waves that are linear. Linear meaning that they're infinitesimally small. Linear acoustic waves have many properties, and of course, my voice in this room and in your recording is all linear. It's very unlikely that there's been a lot of times in your life that you've experienced nonlinear sound phenomena. Um, we can talk about that later in examples if you're curious. Now, if we view speed of sound as an incompressible phenomena, this might be dangerous. So we'll view equation 150 c squared as dpd rho for isentropic. This is our assumption now. We've already made assumptions of the differential elements, removing nonlinear terms from our expansion. So we can say, given these assumptions which I've listed, which I hope you recall and remember, that the speed of sound is a measure of the compressibility of the gas. Earlier in the course, we defined compressibility as tau. This was earlier in the first classes. Speed of sound is also another type of measurability. For example, if the speed of sound is low, we might view the compressibility to be high. If the speed of sound is high, the compressibility is low. 
we might view this as like water versus air. The speed of sound in water, which has very incompressible fluid, is very, very high, while the speed of sound is only about 340 meters per second, or about one-third that of in water for a gas, which is air. Let's do some analysis to illustrate these ideas. Recall that the density goes as one over a volume. Therefore, replacing this, we can write d rho equals negative dv over v squared from this equation. Substituting in to 151, we'll have c squared as partial p partial rho with a substitution of negative partial p partial v v squared. And simplifying, we'll write as negative v divided by 1 over v divided by partial v partial p. So as that compressibility goes to zero, the sound of speed, the speed of sound will become infinite as it becomes incompressible. So here's our comp compressibility factor from earlier in the class. Ta. If we let that go to zero, you can see from this equation that the speed of sound becomes infinite. So if you have a truly incompressible fluid and you model acoustics within it, the speed of sound will be going at infinity. This is completely unphysical, but of course it violates some fundamental laws of physics that waves cannot travel necessarily faster than the speed of light. In this case, the acoustic wave would be traveling faster than the speed of light, which is totally unphysical. Now if we assume that we have a chemically perfect gas, we might write that the pressure times the volume to the gamma is constant. We might differentiate and note in this equation that the volume goes as 1 over a rho, and we would obtain 154, remember, given the assumption of chemically perfect gas. You'll have dp over d rho goes as gamma p over rho, which we can then write as c goes as gamma p over rho, square root. Recall the ideal gas law, which applies for calically perfect gas. P over rho equals RT. I've written it in this way, because you see we have a P over rho, M 154, in the square root. We then have C equals the square root of gamma RT. This is an equation which I hope you can memorize in both these forms. C equals the square root of gamma RT. Earlier in the class, I mentioned that C goes as the square root of temperature. Well, here we are in 154 with this particular relation. So as the temperature increases, of course, so does the speed of sound. So our results show, and physically we find, for chemically perfect gases, like the air, at, at standard conditions at least, will go as temperature to the half power. We can now say, what is the temperature at ambient conditions? Say we have about, I don't know, 290 Kelvin approximately times the gas constant of 293 times gamma, which is the ratio of specific heats of 1.4, take that square root and you'll find a value, in my particular case, of about 343 meters per second. So that means when I'm speaking, my voice travels in the room at approximately 343 meters per second. On a very, very hot day, it would travel even faster. In a very, very cold day, it would travel at a slower speed. So you can see that the Mach number of vehicles is measured against C infinity. And in calically perfect gases, it's really being measured as this term here, square root of gamma RT or square root of gamma P over rho, where P and rho are atmospheric pressures and densities respectively, and T is static temperature. So the speed of the vehicle is actually being measured by some sort of speed of sound in the denominator. And this is where the speed of sound comes from. You can see if a Mach number of a vehicle, maximum Mach number of vehicle is constant, as it rises through the atmosphere, its speed, its actual velocity might be lower because temperature is becoming smaller. And the speed of the vehicle might be set by, of course, Mach number. Because it dictates so much of the flow because it's an important similarity parameter. Let's look at now Mach number in terms of energies of the flow. This is a very interesting relation and analysis which I hope you appreciate to gain more physical insight. Let's let an L set u squared over two divided by some internal energy. So I have a kinetic energy divided by an internal energy. This is my relation. I wanna look at this particular relation myself. I can rewrite E as C sub V times T internal energy and I can now replace T with of course 
perfect gas law in thermodynamic relations. So I'll still have kinetic energy in the numerator. And now RT, gas constant times T, divided by gamma minus one in the denominator. I'll now change RT with C squared from my previous relation here. Square root of gamma RT goes to C squared. That would be gamma RT as C squared. Now you see I have C squared here. I can now replace, of course, and rearrange as gamma divided by gamma minus one here, divided by two, and I have a u squared and a c squared, which become m squared. Try it out yourself. You'll see now that I can show that the kinetic energy divided by the internal energy of the fluid using the speed of sound relation goes as a constant of ratio of specific heats times the ratio of specific heats minus one over two times the Mach squared. Therefore, another interpretation of the Mach number, and you might say, is not really a difference between a speed divided by a speed of sound, but the kinetic energy of the fluid divided by the inter internal energy of the fluid to the half power. So you can say m squared goes proportionally as a kinetic energy divided by the internal energy of the fluid. This amazing analysis was named in the Mach number after none other than Ernst Walfried Joseph Wenzel Mach, who's Australian. He lived from 1838 to 1916, and he's Australian. He was known as a physicist and philosopher. He did interference patterns like we showed in Newton polarization and refraction of light and sound. He is a professor in math at the University of Graz. And of course, he deduced and experimentally confirmed the existence of shock waves of conical shape, which we showed in an earlier class with his famous photo of the bullet crossing wires to show, of course, the leading and trailing edges of shocks. So people thought shock waves existed, and he experimentally confirmed them with his famous photo. He opposed Boltzmann and others, including, of course, people like Reynolds who proposed the atomic theory of the atom in physics. Psychologists remember Ernst Mach for the optical influence called Mach bands, which I might show in class if we have time. So he worked in psychology too. And in psychology departments, they study, of course, and see the so-called Mach bands. Albert Einstein, he's quoted as saying, it is justified to consider Mach as the precursor of the general theory of relativity. What a compliment. Any phenomena that would seem attributable to an absolute space and time in particular. There's a re, uh, well, photo of Ernst Mach, of course, in the late 1800s. Um, fairly fashionable fellow, I think. And after an 1897 lecture in a conference by Ludwig Boltzmann, who we discussed earlier at the Imperial Academy of Science in Vienna, he stood up and yells in the room, I don't believe that atoms exist. You can see what an interesting scientific community was at the time. Nonetheless, in our class in fluid dynamics, we remember Mach, and perhaps most importantly today, first contributions, of course, to the Mach number, which we just discussed, and psychology. And perhaps he's a precursor father for the theory of relativity. Amazing. Let's look at some disturbances and notations of particular fluids now. We'll consider a small, small body moving through a gas. This tiny little sphere, perhaps. And maybe we shoot it from a rifle or something. I don't know. Nonetheless, a small sphere moves through the atmosphere. And this little sphere might be vibrating. And it's causing acoustic waves to propagate in all directions that moves through the atmosphere. It's pretty exciting. The speed, let's let the speed of the little sphere be you. It's the speed of the body. There's also some ambient speed of sound, which as you see, depends mostly on the temperature to the half power. Both U and C are gonna be constant. And then there's also time, which we'll call T. Now we'll draw a series of curves for illustrative purposes of sound waves, just like Newton's diffraction experiment, which emit at constant intervals of T, 2T, and NT. You can imagine that the sphere has a velocity of zero, that there should be concentric circles, or that is spheres, of spherical wavefronts of acoustic waves coming from the source, which is the sphere itself. This is cross plane contours of the acoustic waves. 
In this case, we are the sphere is located at B and it started at A and it went from A to B in some time and its velocity here in the diagram at least is V instead of U. So velocity times time is a distance. So the distance is AB, VT. Now from A to this outer wave, we'll call AT, A to AT. So at some point our sphere was at A and it emitted a wave and that wave travels at the speed of sound. It has traveled faster and a farther distance than any other wave while the sphere has moved along and emitted a second wave, which is seen as this circle, it emitted a third wave, say here, and it emitted a fourth wave at this location just before B, which is shown as this circle, and it moved a little bit farther and it's about to emit another wave, a fifth wave. You'll see at a low speed, at zero speed, the circles will be concentric. At low speed, the circles, of course, will all be concentric and non-overlapping, and they all travel outwards at a speed c, the speed of sound. What happens when the sphere moves faster than the speed of sound? This is what we see and can we observe to create what we call Mach waves. These are not shock waves, there's a subtle difference and many people naively say that this is a justification or um, explanation for the formation of shock waves. It's the same problem. We start at A, the sphere starts at A, and it ends at B. It emits waves through its vibrations as it travels from A to B at particular times, delta T. In this case, the waves form a wave front, which I can draw a line from its current position, present position, that are tangent to the circles. And so this creates a wave front, and this is what causes so-called Mach waves. That some disturbance in the fluid as it moves supersonically past creates these outgoing acoustic waves which are coalescing into a wave front called a Mach wave. You'll have to think about this as a thought experiment. You might also think like what happens when the sphere moves at the speed of sound? What happens then? It's a slightly different phenomenon. Nonetheless, if I draw a line from A to B, and from B to say C along the circle uh, wavefronts, the wavefronts of each acoustic disturbance, and I find the angle, I can find that angle and it'll be mu. This is the so-called Mach angle. In this case, we might call that angle alpha for fun, or mu, doesn't matter, it's just an angle, and it'll go as the sine of mu, or sine of alpha, goes as the speed of sound divided by the velocity of the sphere or disturbance. You might also reverse these and say u is the velocity of the vehicle and c is the ambient speed of sound. Nonetheless, it'll go as 1 over the Mach number. So sine of the angle goes as 1 over m, the angle, the Mach angle, which is the Mach wave formation. Now you might think this is maybe a little bit silly, but we can actually see this in physical observations. And here I'm hoping that your screen is high enough resolution, the video is high enough quality, and I'll try and show this in class if it's not. But we see in this particular photo, Mach waves, which are labeled when this particular Atlas rocket is approaching the transonic condition. And these Mach waves are radiating in front of the rocket through the atmosphere in the direction of flight. So here's the rocket, it's taking off from the ground and ascending to space. And you see out here amongst the clouds, you see these funny little bands. And this isn't because of the digital camera, but someone has gone in and labeled these one, two, three, all the way up to 11. And so these are the waves which are occurring near the transonic condition about U is approximately C for this particular problem. So the waves, of course, are not coalescing because they're in transonic condition. As soon as this vehicle approaches and goes beyond the speed of sound, you'll also have a system of Mach waves which have a particular wave front. These will be, of course, overtaken and dominated by what is the shock wave. Let's now turn our attention to some reference frames. In this case, we have a supersonic flow, Mach greater than 1, moving from left to right, and we have a barrier here which is a wedge. This wedge 
has a particular angle. Say the angle is from the initial direction to the half angle of the wedge, which would be an angle from my cursor down to the center axis. Now, an oblique shock wave forms as we discussed and we'll talk about in this class in a couple of modules. That's shown as this dark black line. That has an angle beta. The Mach waves in this case, which we just introduced as the coalescence of acoustic waves, have a shallower angle and they have an angle mu, which we would find as nothing as sine of mu goes as 1 over m, where m is greater than 1. And so we can actually see these Mach waves in our numerical simulations if we're very careful and maybe even carefully done Schlieren. But just know a Mach wave and the coalescence of acoustic waves are not necessarily what forms a shock wave. That's very confusing and a subtle point. Because in this particular case at least, in this particular case, not all case, the Mach wave angles are not coalescing to form the oblique attached conic shock wave. Let's look at this example once again from another source. In the upper left we have a stationary pulsing sphere and we have concentric circles going out. So it's just like me sitting here and I'm clapping my hands and waves are going out in all directions and as I clap they never coalesce. If I was clapping my hands and walking down the hallway I would have of course circles but they would never be coalescing. And as I approach the transonic condition Mach 1, if I could travel at Mach 1 and make a periodic sound, you would see a wave structure of acoustic waves coalescing in front of me, but never meeting each other behind me. You can imagine that this is also an explanation of the Doppler effect, that when we move along and acoustic sources move along, that the frequency changes based on the observer. For example, an observer here in the upstream direction from the moving source right here might experience waves which have wave fronts which are closer together. Therefore, the frequency has increases and it'll be a higher tone. A person behind the observer as it passes will experience a lower frequency because the wave fronts are farther apart. This is a simple explanation of the Doppler effect, which of course Doppler's famous for when he studied trains and train whistles going by at different speeds. The final conditions, stationary, subsonic, sonic, transonic, and supersonic is shown in the lower right. Here the sphere moves from right to left and the waves are coalescing against some particular wavefront which we've already discussed. You can see that this angle of the wavefront is never 90 degrees for supersonic moving bodies and it is 90 degrees for the transonic case. The first location for the coalescence of waves of course is right in front of the sphere, for example the case of a transonics and is always somewhere else, for example, for the supersonic case. I'll now let you read through particular examples uh, for calculation of speed of sound. And this one I'll just mention as number one. You can try number two on your own. It'll say for air at gamma 1.4 ratio specific heats at ambient temperature 288 Kelvin, which is 60 degrees Fahrenheit, find the speed of sound, which they call A in this example. They'll say A, or I like to call C for most of the class, will go as square root of gamma RT which will be the square root of 1.4 times the gas constant times the temperature 288 Kelvin. That comes out to be 340 meters per second, which is just the standard value for the speed of sound in the atmosphere. You can then see how it affects to maybe a hot day or a cold day. Say the temperature went from 288 Kelvin to 300, you can now do the same calculation with the same gas constant and ratio of specific heats and see that the speed of sound went up by, by 7 meters per second. You can then find the Mach number of the particular vehicle. The vehicle is moving at 200 miles per hour, and we know the speed of sound at this particular temperature for the day. And you'll see this NASCAR at 200 miles per hour for an average day in Florida at least is only Mach 0.26. So you can see the compressibility effects at 200 miles per hour is rather small, and we would just neglect them in an analysis. Here's an example which I created for, of course, Mach number of an aircraft where I ask you to find the max velocity at 5 degrees and 45 degrees for an aircraft that has a max Mach number of 0 0.91. I'll let you try this on your own.
Here's one example I want to discuss. In 1972, an asteroid came in on August 10th and seen by a large number of people, including a camera, thankfully at that time, bearing the tours of the Grand Teton National Park, which is a beautiful national park, of course, out near Yellowstone in our great country. Estimates by those who observed and from camera estimated the altitude at 100 kilometers. And from the picture and our theory of wave angles, estimated the speed as 14.8 kilometers per second. The mass of this particular asteroid was 1 billion kilograms, or a million tons if you prefer English units. The diameter was on the order of tens of meters. Can you estimate the Mach number of the asteroid if you could see the wave system it generated and how would it appear? Think about this carefully. In the picture here, the asteroid is this little bright spot here, and there's the wave has formed. And so that wave angle is so small it must be moving at a very, very high speed. Let's try out this example. The standard atmosphere tables available on the internet give us a temperature is about 180 Kelvin at 100 kilometers, which is about the edge of space. Let's estimate the speed of sound at 100 kilometers using the standard atmosphere. We'll have about 1.4 times 287 the gas constant times 180 Kelvin. Take the square root and we get 270 meters per second. The Mach number of the asteroid, which was about 14.8 kilometers divided by 270 meters per second, is Mach 55. This is certainly a rarefied hypervelocity flow of reentry. Think about the energy in this field, in this asteroid, which is uh, what was the mass? Uh, a billion kilograms estimated, moving at Mach 55 or 200 or 14.8 kilometers per second. So this is a hypervelocity flow regime, and a very, very strong shock wave heats up the atmosphere, and of course it becomes a plasma which radiates, which is what you're seeing in the picture. Right there, great new picture. We can assume, according to just the Mach wave theory, that the angle, let's just say, is about one degrees according to Mach 55. So we can find the wave angle one, one degrees, and that's about what you would see in the picture. So the Mach wave angle estimate, or the shock wave angles, are very much alike in hypervelocity flows because they approach each other. And we can see that trailing wave system. So from this simple analysis, we can calculate approximately the speed of the asteroid from its wave angle. If you calculate the energy, it's about 10 to the 17th joules based on its mass and velocity squared, which was estimated from the wave angle and altitude, which was based on standard atmosphere. You'll see that this particular asteroid has about TNT equivalent to produce about 4 million joules per kilogram. In terms of TNT, this is 24 megatons of TNT, which is very much similar to the largest US hydrogen bomb ever developed in the United States. Of course, this would be devastating if it hit the Earth, and some asteroids at hypervelocity speeds and masses do hit the Earth, creating catastrophic events, which might have, of course, caused extinction of the dinosaurs. Here are some other examples of high-speed flow and entry. The upper left is some kinetic heating. Uh, excuse me, the upper right, upper left is the Mars Phoenix probe and the Arc Tunnel. Lower right is the burning of a hypersonic model in the AEDC, Arnold Engineering Development Center. And in the lower left, of course, is the Spatial Columbia disaster. And you can find movies of many of these things online if you're so curious. But these are examples of the immense energy and power and high-speed Mach numbers of these particular flows. Do not confuse, for example, the upper right image, this wave here around the body of the vehicle, as something of a Mach wave. No, that's just a very, very strong shock wave, which we'll talk about later in this flow. But these are all hypervelocity, high speed flows, which is a wonderful subject on its own. You might ask yourself now, what assumptions are we making or have we violated in reality? First of all, the atmosphere has non uniform properties of temperatures, pressures, densities, velocities, and it's highly turbulent. This means that when waves, acoustic or shock waves or otherwise, expansion waves or anything, travels through the atmosphere, we can't truly always form these assumptions we've made. In this one particular beautiful picture, 
we can see there's the turbulent atmosphere. In this case, sound waves would be refracted and reflected as they travel through the atmosphere off the ground and trees and just through the sky. Much like a rainbow forms that refracts light, the density variations in the atmosphere refract sound and curve it. This must be accounted for in high fidelity and accurate calculations in our field. In this class, we looked at one-dimensional flows and their simple analysis for constant area. We'll return to the variable area problem later. We then discussed the basics of acoustics and wave propagation using the same formulation by replacing u with c and its differentials, the speed of sound and differentials. We then derived the speed of sound making a number of assumptions. c equals the square root of gamma rt is the formula that you should memorize. We also looked at how Mach number changes with kinetic energy over internal energy and other framework. We then derived and discussed Mach wave theory as movement of disturbances. Thank you very much for your time today. I'm Professor Steve Miller.